Hello, I'm Jyotika. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm presenting to you yet another lesson on how to write answers in the paper. This time I'm going to help you write answers to your stimulus questions in paper 4. As you can see on the screen, students tend to take these questions very casually because they appear to be very brief. 2 markers, 4 markers, 5 markers. So they feel they must be very easy to answer and they don't really prepare for them. They put in all their energy into preparing for the 12 markers and the 8 and 10 markers. And that is how they lose marks. A lot of marks that they could have gained in this section. So today let's learn seriously how to answer these questions. And yes, we can easily achieve marks on them. Provided we prepare well and take the right approach to them. Marks will not come automatically. I have taken a stimulus from an actual past paper to exemplify the points I am going to make. My intention is not to read out these answers to you, explain these particular answers to you. Rather, my intention with this video is to explain to you the principles of answering a uh, paper 4 stimulus with the help of the examples of the model answers that I am going to present. Here I have noted the paper number. For your convenience, I will upload all these model answers on my website, alevels.excellingpsychology.com. My website which has a lot of uh, material for AS and A-level students. You will find this also there and more helpful material is available. So do visit the site. I will link it in the description box below. Okay, uh, you can go through the stimulus for a minute. You could pause the video and go through it or you could visit my website and download the document that I am uploading there. I am now going to read out the stimulus. I am going to move ahead towards explaining to you how you should be writing answers. So let's look at the first question. In the first question, we have been asked to outline a psychological explanation of phobias on which the case study is based. This question has been assigned two marks. For a two marker, a rough rule or a rule of thumb is we should aim to answer it in two sentences. No hard and fast rule. But that serves the purpose. The first sentence in terms of structure should be about an outline of the psychological explanation but not generically with reference to the stimulus that has been presented and the next sentence can explicitly link the explanation that we have provided with the stimulus presented. So two sentences, one outlining the explanation, the second linking the explanation to the stimulus. Let's see how this can be done. In our syllabus, there is one psychological explanation that's been taken, which is classical conditioning. As such, there are many psychological explanations of phobia. But since this is the one present in our syllabus, we can explicitly name it. It directly addresses the question. So it's a good practice to name something that is specific right in the first sentence itself. Then, as I said, we explain it in a line. So using the chief proposition of the classical conditioning theory, we uh, explain the psychological explanation. We just outline it. We don't explain it as such because it's a brief answer. So we just present the chief proposal. The chief proposal definitely is that a neutral stimulus when paired with an unconditioned stimulus evokes a fear response. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, with this lesson, my intention is not to explain the stimulus to you. So I'm not going to go into the depth of the answer. I assume you know about classical conditioning. If you don't and you're not able to follow this video, please learn it before continuing with the video. Okay, so I have given the chief proposition. The most important thing you have to notice here is, as such, classical conditioning explains many things. But I have not given a generic outline of what is classical conditioning. I have linked it with the fear response. Because what I have been asked for in the stimulus is phobia. So I have to explain classical conditioning as it is relevant to phobia, not in general. So I have done that. And to make it even more specific to the stimulus or to link it to the stimulus, in the next sentence, those key terms that I have given in the proposition, I have linked it with where exactly those terms are coming into play into the in the stimulus. For example, the neutral stimulus in the given study of little Albert is the white rat. So I have named that and I have mentioned that it is the neutral stimulus. 
than condition stimulus in little albert's case is the loud sound so i've named that again and linked it uh, by stating that it is the unconditioned stimulus if instead of this say i would have been asked for a biological explanation or a socio cultural explanation my structure would remain the same the first sentence would give the socio cultural or biological explanation in general terms how it explains phobia in particular and next with whatever stimulus was given i would have pointed out okay this is where the proposition comes into play in this particular stimulus so that is how we answer the first question the next question asks us for two marks one reason why the case study could be considered unethical whenever we answer any question about ethics be it about how an ethical guideline was followed or be it how an ethical guideline was broken which is in other terms what has been asked here what was unethical about the study it is most important to name the ethical guideline that we are going to be discussing the major mistake that students make i'm so sorry the major mistake that students make is that they do not name the ethical guideline they just go on explaining it without naming it that is not the way to answer these questions so first i have named why the study could be considered an ethical being specific about which ethical guideline could be considered as having been broken which is protection from physical harm again protection from harm is a broad guideline within that we have to be specific about its physical harm that we are discussing or psychological as of now i'm discussing physical harm so that is what i have mentioned so explicitly naming the guideline is important but it is not enough because the question is not asking us to name it again the question is asking us to explain explain meaning why are we saying that the protection from physical harm line harm guideline has been broken answering why is very important in an explain question when we answer why it automatically makes the answer very specific so in the case of little albert why i'm saying this guideline was violated was because albert was just 9 months old and a very loud sound was repeatedly played right next to his ears which could have damaged his immature hearing ability of his nervous system at that age so both are equally important naming the guideline and linking to the stimulus presented we can expect one mark for each to score a total of two marks the next question that has been asked is one generalization that can be made from this case study again for two marks generalization the mistake students make is to assume that it is just generalizability or ap applying the uh, the results found from a sample to the population generalization has two meanings one is definitely extending results from a sample to a target population the other is ex uh, extending results from the context of the study to real world settings that is external generalizability or what we often call ecological validity so when generalization is asked for we need not restrict ourselves to sample to population generalization so as we can see in the answer also uh, the generalization that we can make from this study is that young children can develop a phobia for animals and not necessarily white rats any animals so not necessarily to the context of the experiment only that just because a white rat was used in the experiment that is the only extent to which the results apply they could also apply to the phobia that is developed of other animals so in that context also we can take generalization in the real world or in real settings there are so many animals that people can be afraid of so results could extend there as well what is important as always is in this answer also to first present the general idea to name exactly what we are taking up as the point for generalization so to explicitly mention the point we are taking up for generalization that phobia can be developed of various animals and then to exemplify it uh, we cannot pick up an example from this study because we have been asked to generalize beyond the study so then we need to present an example that is something additional that is something more than this study so when we are talking about 
phobia for different animals it's so easy to think of some common phobia that we have observed around us or heard of and we can easily present that so this answer is definitely not challenging we hear of a lot of people being phobic of stray dogs so we can definitely give an example of how people can associate stray dogs uh, with the suffering or pain that could come from them being bitten by those dogs so that we've taken as an example here other examples could include phobia of snakes phobia of some insects we could talk about those as well so for the first three questions which were all two markers the structure is very similar naming a point explicitly in the first sentence and exemplifying it either with the stimulus or outside the stimulus as required in the second point coming to the four marker they have asked us for two reasons why the findings of the study cannot be generalized again what we need to keep in view here is generalization does not mean only from the sample to the population that can be one of the points but one more can be for, uh, to outside the research context so for this answer i have taken up both the points each point has a weightage of 2 marks because the total weightage is 4 marks so for each of the points that we are going to make one point will be one mark will be for explicating the point and the second mark will be for exemplifying it so the first point that i'm making it is that there cannot be generalizability in terms of from sample to the population because of the very restricted sample size having only one participant in the study that is only little albert so how i make it more clear or link it to the stimulus is by pointing out that albert could have been unique in terms of uh, his natural tendency of how fearful he could be or how anxious he could become by uh, the surroundings the conditions created around him how receptive he was to conditioning so by giving these points as examples i'm making it clear what i mean by oh okay there was a single participant so it can't generalize to the population again i'm justifying my point i'm saying why it is that a single participant becomes a problem in the way of generalization with reference to little albert the next point i have made is that again the phobia was for a specific stimulus that is a very particular type of animal the white rat and whatever was closely related to the white rat so it becomes difficult to generalize whether people would develop similar phobias uh, of other animals or other objects or not as we have suggested in the previous answer that is one of the possibilities it could apply but there's no guarantee of it further studies would have to be done to find out whether this is a possibility or not so directly from this study we cannot say that that type of a generalization can take place so that is our second point in the second point also first i have named that i'm saying that the point i'm making is about the specific stimulus that was used in the study and then i have given an example by saying that to other animals or to other objects these findings might not apply finally coming to the five marker here they have asked us for advantages and disadvantages of conducting research on phobias in the laboratory and they have also asked us for a conclusion to our answer now what students assume here and what has been told to them in many schools because many of my students come up with this Uh, in this answer you do not de- need to elaborate much on the points which is right but then it is not that you do not have to elaborate at all so for example if you are saying that the strength of a laboratory study is that there is manipulation of the independent variable they are not asking you to just name or list points or to just identify no doubt uh, they are g- allotting just one mark for a point but that does not mean that you just generally name everything without any reference to the stimulus and you present the points you do elaborate a little bit not much but you do elaborate that's the point okay so one strength as we know for laboratory experiment is that there can be systematic manipulation of what is presented which increases reliability of findings because the researcher is in complete control of how he is presenting the independent variable he can make all trials exactly identical or consistent which increases reliability 
Now, this is a very generic point. So, I have to link it to the study. So, what I say is what he can manipulate in one line. In that same sentence, I'm mentioning that in the case of phobia, he can manipulate the presentation of the phobic stimulus. I'm not elaborating much. I'm not giving an example. Oh, this could be the phobic stimulus, like a rat or a dog could be the stimulus and he could manipulate how he's presenting by uh, showing a photograph of the dog or by presenting an actual dog to the participant. I'm not going into that much detail, but at least I'm mentioning what he can manipulate when it comes to phobia. At least that much I have to do to make it relevant. So that is how we answer this question. Also, another strength as we know of laboratory experiments is the control over extraneous variables. Again, I'm not going into too much details, but I do give an example by saying that when it comes to phobia and if mild, uh, if phobia is being uh, investigated in the laboratory, so the researchers can keep their appearance mild so as to not make the appearance a cause of the phobia in the participants rather than the stimulus that they are manipulating. So very simple example to make my point relevant to phobia. Again, not going into any further details. So I'm not suggesting how the appearance should be. If it was allotted two marks, I would say that the experimenter should have a mild appearance. He should wear casual clothes or something like that. But I'm not making those suggestions because that is not required in this point. I'm just kind of uh, detailing my point to an extent to make it relevant, that's all. One disadvantage as we know of laboratory experiments is that they can include demand characteristics. So when it comes to a phobic study, how demand characteristics can arise is because people could be uh, not fearful of an object, but they could act fearful just because they feel that is what the researchers expect them to do because the researchers are manipulating the phobic stimulus. I am not again given an example. Why I am reiterating on this point is because I am showing you how much elaboration is justified for one mark and how much more would be required for two marks. So where I am limiting myself. So I am not giving an example like, oh, if the researcher was manipulating a rat and uh, the participants uh, as such are not afraid of a small rat, but still they would pretend to be afraid of it. I'm not going into those type of details. I'm just mentioning that they could know what the researchers' expectations are. To make it relevant, if I just say they would know what the expectations are, again, it becomes generic. So in phobia, what the expectations can be that the researcher expects them to fear something. So that they will not show. Uh, so that they will show fear because that is what they think is expected from them. As simple as that. Also, we know lab experiments have poor ecological validity. Realism is missing. So in case of phobia, any phobia that is developed in the laboratory may not be found in real life where there are other variables that can interfere in the relationship. If I had to answer this for a two mark, I would also mention that there could be somebody available to counsel the person so you would not allow him to become fearful of that stimulus or the person might have options of avoiding the stimulus or escaping from it, which he does not have in the laboratory. But I'm not giving those possibilities because I'm restricting myself to one mark. But just to make it relevant to phobia, I'm pointing out exactly why ecological validity could be a problem simply because the phobia seen in the lab uh, gets confounded by many variables in the real world. Conclusion is definitely allotted one mark. A conclusion just needs to give a summary of all the points and as far as possible, it needs to combine both the strengths, both the weaknesses and say, okay, this is the good thing about doing a lab experiment for phobia and this is the bad thing. So these are the pros and these are the cons. Very succinctly, we have to present it. So in terms of what is good about a lab experiment, as we have discussed, the conclusion has to come from there only. So what is good is that we get very reliable and valid results. Or we could also say that results are very psychometrically sound. But the problem is that the realism isn't there. Or there can be demand characteristics and poor generalizability, which could keep the results just restricted to the lab and not allow them to be seen outside. So this type of a simple conclusion suffices for this answer. I've kept my video brief to make this a quick lesson. So if you have any doubts, you can ask me in the comments below. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you in another one. Goodbye.